do it. Okay. All right. Hello. Good morning, Denny. Hi. Good morning. How are you? I am doing great. Happy I'm inside. It's kind of windy. <laughs> How about oh, you? We've got a little bit of frost outside, so I'm, I'm glad to be inside where it's warm. Ooh, yeah. I'm frosty, yeah. <laughs> Clean motherhood, mindset, motivation. That's, mm -hmm. that's my jam. I'm all about family life coaching. Mm -hmm. um, so anything that a mom can do for herself, it reflects and it shows for her kids too. Yes, yes, so. I totally agree. That is, that is exactly what I'm all about. And your story, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is such an awesome story. I want, okay, I which want story it. did you hear? I, your story about gratitude around Thanksgiving. Ah, yes, yes, yes. And I, I really resonated with it because I had an experience that was, you know, kind of like, <gasps> as well. So I, I get it. I know, mm -hmm, I know how mm -hmm. it goes. <laughs> mm -hmm, for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I, I I love the the theme because um, you know I had been I'll, I'll tell you sort of what got me to go off on my own. I had been working for you know a Fortune 100 manufacturing company for a good almost 12 whole years, oh, wow. and probably about by year two or three, I knew that I was in the wrong place, but for a variety of reasons, right? Imposter syndrome, fear, um, sort of my own ego wanting to prove that I could do it and still be successful in this place. All of those things um, kept me there. And then also after a while you get, you know, comfortable and complacent and it was safe and secure mm -hmm. and the money was good and it looked good on your resume. And so, so much of your identity starts to get wrapped up in this organization, but I was so miserable, so unfulfilled. And it's that moment where you've literally checked every single box that's been laid out for you of what, what makes someone be successful. Like, what are the check boxes for success? Like you make so much money, you have a good job, you've got the title, you've got the brand, you, you've got good degrees, degrees from great companies, you've got all of these things. Mm -hmm. you've got the house you've got the nice car you're in the right neighborhood all of the things that you can all the boxes that you could possibly check and you have arrived and you think that when you're arrived you're supposed to be happy and you're supposed to feel fulfilled and I had arrived and I was like now what this sucks like this is miserable and I you know I remember being physically nauseous Monday mornings and so anxious Sunday nights that I tossed and turned and never slept well. I hated Sundays. I probably hated Sundays more than I hated Mondays because I knew that at the end of Sunday, Monday was coming. Mm -hmm. And Monday mornings, I would sit in the parking lot of my office for five, 10 minutes, just trying to will myself to walk through the door. And it's not that the job was terrible. I just wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't challenged in the way that I needed to be challenged. And I knew for a fact that I wasn't being valued in the way that I wanted to be valued and that I wouldn't meet my truest and ultimate potential if I stayed put. But I just did, you know, I was scared. Well, who's going to hire me? Who's going to pay me this much? I spent this much time doing stuff that doesn't matter to them. So does it matter to anybody else? So all those thoughts, right? Until, um, about five years ago, five or six years ago, I met my husband and we started dating. And so, you know, I was distracted. So I was like, okay, well, this job is fine right now. So I got something else going on and we got engaged. And so now I'm planning a wedding. So, you know, it's easy to cruise in this job because I'm planning a wedding. So I don't want to, you know, have all this and it's a great, great money. So now we can pay for the wedding. And then we got pregnant. Okay, well, you know, I am just planning to go through this pregnancy, you know, all of this stuff easy. You can't leave now because who's going to give you maternity leave, all of that stuff. And they treated me terribly throughout my, throughout my pregnancy, right? Um, and it was super stressful, um, so stressful that my doctor pulled me out for two weeks on FMLA and then pulled me out early again at the end of my pregnancy. Um, and so 
my and I and so for those five years, I was just complacent. I'm like, okay, well, there are other things that are more important than career because as women, you know, our priorities ebb and flow. Sometimes it's work, sometimes it's life, sometimes it's family, sometimes whatever. And you know, so at that point, career wasn't it. it I knew that I was meant for more, but it wasn't the most important thing. And then my son turned one and I was like, okay, something's got to give. This can't be, this isn't the example that I want to set for him. And this can't be sort of all that there is to life. This isn't the end. Now I've, I've, I've accomplished the last two checks, right? Get married and have a kid. So now I'm done with my, 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 my checklist of success and this, this isn't enough. And so I hired a coach in September, knowing that, feeling that my job was going to offer some voluntary separation opportunities in the near future. Like I felt the writings on the wall, the economy was wonky. Uh, we were having trade wars with China, all sorts of stuff that impact manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be ready this time because I wasn't ready the last time, but I wanted to be ready this time to take advantage of it. And I hired a coach just to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I thought that I was going to, you know, start posting for strategy director roles at various companies locally. And that was sort of my next step. And in our work together, we decided, well, I decided that I wanted to coach. I had been coaching internally um, for my company for years and coaching and leading my team and all the development work that's what lit me up and um <laughs> if I'm being 100% transparent when she first told me her prices I was like oh y'all charging this for what I've been doing for free and people are paying for it oh okay I can build a business off of this and so instead of me applying to jobs when the uh when the the offer came to take a voluntary package I decided to launch my business and of course, that was a crazy decision, big decision. Um, and, and then the day before I was supposed to sign the papers is when my, my son had a seizure. So part of me was like that day, I was like, you know, you need to go back to work. What if, what if this is not just a one-time thing. Like, what if he has issues? You need more insurance. You guys need to double cover him, cover him in case he has a lot of medical issues. Or um, who knows? Like, maybe this is a sign that you're supposed to stay put. You have stable income. All of these things. Maybe you're not. This isn't. This isn't right. And oh my God, I tossed and turned and struggled with that. Like, I thought I'd made the decision, <laughs> right? I thought I was over that hump. And then, and then I was like, you know what? It's all or nothing. You've got, you got to do it. And so I literally, um, we came from the, we, we went into the hospital with my, with my son on Sunday morning. We got released Monday afternoon. I kept him overnight. And I literally came home with my husband and my son changed clothes and went straight to the office to sign my paperwork to exit. And there was such a sense, I mean, I cried in the car once I finished and it was like, but it was such a relief because I was finally free. Finally free to see if I got what it takes, right? To not just settle to to bet on me to um not give in to fear to feel the fear and still move uh and it was terrifying but there was so much peace you know i wiped my tears and came home hugged my baby and the next day you know we're in business baby we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna make things happen so yeah that's sort of the journey of, and that, and that will, that's like a, a year ago in a week um, of what brought me here. And so in my practice, you know, I really want to, I feel like I'm not alone. I'm not unique in that experience. I'm not unique in having achieved everything that everyone said would make you successful and still being miserable. There's so many people that are um, 
technically successful, but they have let everybody else define it for them. And I'm not alone at being late thirties and still not being clear on what I'm supposed to be doing, what impact I'm supposed to have in the world and how I'm supposed to show up in the world. And I'm not alone at being talented but yet being stifled in an organization that didn't truly either see my worth or know how to optimize my worth. Mm. And, you know, I'm not alone in facing discrimination and microaggressions and all the things that women and minorities are faced with in, in the corporate space. I'm not alone in, you know, juggling family and figuring out sort of my groove. And, um, you know, there are tons of women who are able to stay home and want to stay home. And I will say I am not alone in the fact that although I work from home, I do not want to be a full-time caregiver. That is not my interest. Please take this child to daycare at some point, right? And, you know, as a mom, sometimes that's hard to say, but I know I'm not alone in that feeling either. Um, and so really, I want to, at the, at the core of my business, at the core of not even the business, but sort of my, my purpose and passion in life is to empower people to dare to dream bigger. And this sort of dream bigger theme had been on my mind, in my spirit, probably since I was a teenager. It's this recurring theme. And so I want to empower people to dream bigger and help them to uh, really build careers that enable them to live the lives of their dreams. So a lot of career coaches just think about career. What do you want to do? You know, what are your skills? What's your experience? Or, okay, then go to this position. This is how you get there. But I think that there's so many things that people are good at. And we often find ourselves doing things simply because we are good at them or because someone asked us to do them. But not because that serves us, that lights us up, or any mm -hmm. of those things. And so... I want to empower people to design careers that enable them to live the life of their dreams. And so, yeah, maybe you might be the best surgeon in the world, but if that work-life balance doesn't enable you to live the life that you want, doesn't allow you to coach your kid's soccer team, if that's your desire, or do the things that you want, then who are you being a surgeon for? Whose dream was that? Is that your dream? Is that... Is that your definition of success or does somebody else tell you that was the, the guidepost, that was the finish line? Mm -hmm. And so we, we never start with what job do you want or what promotion do you want? But <laughs> we always start with what do you want to do? What, how do you want to live your life? What time do you want to wake up? How do you, if you had the perfect week when you weren't on vacation, what would it look like? What time mm -hmm. would you wake up? What would you eat? Where would you go? What would you have to wear? Who's around you? What, if you're at work, what skills are you using? You know, what types of people are you working with? What environment are they, are you in? What's the office look like? Do you have your own office? Are you in a cubicle? Are you working from home? Are you traveling? What does it look like? And do you have them write it down? Yes. Awesome. Yes, yeah, I do too. Write it down. I find a lot in, in, writing it down like there's there's oh, lots yeah. of neuro research on that so yes. yeah yes and, and and once you've done that then that that's the litmus test that's the filter for all of these other career opportunities because any given person there's a there's several different career paths they could technically do they're qualified to do they can leverage transferable skills to do the question is, which one supports the life that you want? 
Like someone can say, oh, I really like traveling and I love planes. So I want to be a flight attendant. Okay, great. And then a year into being a flight attendant, they're miserable because they, they just thought about career. They didn't think about their life. And now they're mad. Their family's upset because they're not home at a, enough. They can't go to the basketball games and not helping with dinner, all of these things. Well, let's back up. There are tons of other careers that will allow you to travel, maybe even interact with airplanes <laughs> and be home to cook your children dinner or be home to, you know, play golf with your husband or whatever it is that, you know, is ultimately your life, the life that you ultimately dream of. So that's my whole spiel. I really just want people to stop settling for these lives that the world tells us we should want and should be grateful for. And I want to challenge us to go get what we want, to go get the life we were put here for and let everything else fall in place. Mm -hmm. I love that. And there's, there's so much power in writing that down and designing your own life. And there was a book that I was reading that she said, it's this or something better. And yes. so when I write it, that's um, Gabby Bernstein. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'll write. It's this or something better. I and I, I just said that to a client the other day and she goes, oh. I said, yeah. So if that doesn't happen, that means something better is going to happen. Something better. I love it. <laughs> oh, I love that perspective so much. Mm -hmm. And I love, you know, we talk about the, the science around the science and whatever you call the universe just conspires when mm -hmm. you put it down somewhere where you can see it. And I remember, um, I remember early in my career, I, you know, I, I went to business school, I came out, I wanted to be a general manager. I wanted to see sort of everything. I didn't want to be stifled by a specific function I wanted to be able to do different things and just lead. And I would say, people will say, well, Denitris, what do you want to, what do you want to do? Do you want to be in operations? Do you want to be in marketing? Do you want to be in finance? And I say, you know, listen, I can learn anything. I have the background to pick up anything. These are the three things that are important for me. I want to have impact, real meaningful impact on the business. I want to have global exposure, a global career, and I want to be able to lead, develop, and manage a team. If those three things are in place, I can figure out the mechanics, whether it's marketing, finance, supply chain, operations, whatever. I can figure out those mechanics if those three things are in place. And you would think that would make things easier. No one knew what to do with that. <laughs> So after seven years, I finally, uh, seven years in various strategy roles, I finally let them uh, get me to major, major in supply chain, um, which just seemed to touch everything. Um, but I think back to those three things that I'd said, and I've written them down repeatedly. And I think about my business now, one of my very first uh, well, technically my second, my second client was a, a, a former colleague who is, who at the time was on an expat assignment in Madrid. So we were talking about all the challenges of working in another country, ramping up on a language that's not your own. He had no Spanish before he left. He showed up, spoke no Spanish, had to figure it all out all of those things, and now it's time for him to come back to the States and figure out what he's going to do with his life. Does he, does he want to come back to the States? Because now he loves being, you know, sort of the international man of mystery in his family and his friend circle. Um, but, you know, it was great. He had, you know, that was like, oh, global exposure. I'm having impact in his life and I am developing folks. I'm, we're talking about your gaps and all those things. I had another client. Uh, who we just finished up not not too long ago, who is uh, an immigrant from Colombia, uh, first generation. And we're talking about, you know, the challenges that he had in 
making his selection for undergrad. And now that he's thinking about going back to graduate school, he wants to make a more informed decision than he made before when he didn't know the lay of the land and didn't know all of the things that he should be considering. And he is very clear that he wants to go to grad school internationally. And so we're talking about schools in London and Canada. And, you know, so again, it's, it's developmental, it's having true meaningful impact in this life and it's this global reach. So I wrote it down mm -hmm. at least a decade ago mm -hmm. and here we are. That's how things work. Yeah, totally. So I love that you were going over that about your clients. If you were to think about like your ideal client, your ideal avatar, like what, what does that client look like? What are their, you know, pain points? What are they looking for? What do they not know that they need to know? This is always, I wish it was an easier question for me to answer. Um, my ideal client avatar, they are minority and or female. They are mid to senior in their career. They have um, you know, high performing. They have likely experienced some sort of microaggression, some sort of um, just feeling of having to sort of play the corporate game. They have been, they're very ambitious. They want to move forward. They um, may have been struggling to get to the next step, get the next promotion, or they realize what they're doing isn't what they want to do. And so they're looking to pivot. Um, and some of those folks might be pivoting to another company, pivoting to a different sort of industry function altogether, or even pivoting into entrepreneurship. Um, but they know they're ready for a change at, at any level. They're, they're ready for a change or they just finished a change and want to make sure that they are ramping up in that new role well. Um, they are fun and open and eclectic and like to travel and like music and are social and they may be a little introverted but are still conversationally uh, adept. Um, what else? I don't know. They are likely uh, one of the first in their families to have um, arrived <laughs> at the place of success that they are. And so- I like that air quote. <laughs> so they, um, they've they been figuring it out on their own um, with the help of, you know, some mentors here and there, but they, you know, they haven't had, they're, they're not at the dinner table on the holidays with the uncle who's the CEO of this and the cousin who's the CFO of that. They don't have access to sort of the secret decoder ring of, of success. So they've been figuring it out. They've been winging it, so to speak, or they've been using that old playbook that our parents and their parents passed down um, that that playbook that said hard work pays off, meritocracy works. If you just keep your head down and work hard, you will get noticed. If you wait your turn, you'll get your promotion, sort of all mm. of that. That sorry, playbook. I have to roll my eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry. They, I know exactly what you're talking about, though. They have. They're using that playbook. They are. Um, because that's what yeah. we were told, right? That's what we were told. Like that's most we told. all of us, that's what we were told. Head down, work hard. It'll all work itself out. Um, and this group, they, they aren't com completely comfortable or haven't been comfortable bringing their whole selves to work, bringing their whole selves to their career. So there's always been sort of a mask. Um of conformity so that they will be acceptable in these corporate spaces. And that is chipping away just a little bit. And that is 
unbeknownst to them holding them back a little bit because the truth is that playbook is dead and the new playbook says that business is all about relationships and we say oh it's just business it's not personal well business is personal Mm -hmm. and real deep meaningful relationships require authenticity and if you are operating in these spaces with a mask on everyone else can feel that and so because you're holding back other people are also holding back and you're not getting and I get the the mask there's a reason why people wear a mask right because these Mm -hmm. are unsafe waters too for many especially minorities and women um so I'm not discounting the reason that we wear a mask but the mask also holds you back and so part of the work that I really want to inspire and encourage with folks is this boldness to strip away the mask and bring your whole authentic self, your your, the fullness of who you are to the table. Because when you hold back, you might not realize it, but when you're holding back the fullness of who you are, you're not doing as well as you could be. You're not, your work isn't as complete. When Mm -hmm. you are filtering your voice and um, tempering your thoughts and your comments and your feedback, you are not delivering as well as you could. You're not optimizing your performance. And And you're not deepening and building those deep relationships that would best serve you. And I think part of that is because we have have this theory of networking that your network has to be really, really big. That's what networking is. Like, meet as many people as you possibly can. People need to know who you are, know your name, blah, blah, blah. That's not networking. That's branding. The networking, for networking to be meaningful, for networking to be valuable, it has to be a meaningful relationship. Because what's the point of networking? I don't want to just say, oh, I met Christy before. I have Christy's card somewhere in my Rolodex. There's no value in that for you, for me just having your card somewhere in my Rolodex. And people feel that too. Like I'm a woo woo person. I'm a feelings person, like hundred percent of the way. Like you walk around like that in that room that you're talking about, it is felt in the room. That vibration is going all out. And that may sound woo woo. That may sound out of nowhere, but science has shown that all those vibrations are like radio stations. You can just dial them, tune them, change them. I'm like, wow. Okay, we need to remember that. (laughs) Absolutely. People feel when you're genuine, people feel when you're phony. And that's why many introverts struggle with networking, especially in large settings. And so when we think about networking, we think that's how we have to do it. Well, that's not. That's not how you have to do it. What you need to do is be very intentional about building your network and be very intentional about nurturing your network so that you are there for people when they need you and they are there for you when you need them. Because if it's not that mutual back and forth, what is the point? <laughs> what is yeah. the point of having of having met someone that you have no intention of following up with that is barely going to remember you other than just to say I met them? Yeah. Well, and your strengths too, right? Like everyone's strengths lie in that. Oh, you know, I met Denny and her strengths are in business and CEOs and mine are in feelings and, you know, what the mindset is and emotional wellness for my clients. Like, well, I may have someone who I'm like, they need to talk to her. I know, I know your girl here. I'm going to send you her way. You know, that is so much more powerful than, Mm. oh yeah, I have a list of 10 people here, you know, you can take a look, like, see who you right. like. Like, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not as impactful. And for for years, for years, I used to say I am terrible at networking. 
I used to say, I do not make new friends. I used to say, you know, uh, I focus on quality over quantity, which is absolutely true. And I'll tell you when, uh, when I decide, when, when my husband proposed and I sat down to write a list of bridesmaids, this from the girl who said, I don't make friends easily. I don't have any new friends. The list was like 14 women long. And he was like, you've got to cut this. <laughs> we cannot, I don't have enough people on the other side of the aisle. This is not going to work. And I was able to cut it down. I think I got it down to eight. And um, I call, that was when it finally clicked that I legitimately have a squad of powerful badass women on my team who will drop anything to be there for me if I need. And I didn't realize that I was like, oh, I've got, you know, two best friends, three best friends. I've known them since high school and college. And I've got some other folks that I've met along the way who are important to me. Just leave it at that. But I don't really make, I don't make friends easily. I don't have that many friends, blah, blah, blah. Because I had this, this quantity in order you know in order to build relationships you've got everybody's got to know you and love you and like you that's that's the requirement that well, was your limiting belief it was it was such a limiting belief and in t until that moment there's a there is a wedding picture that I have of me and my bridesmaids sort of on the steps where we got married and it's such a like kick-ass picture it's so adorable and I love it so much because it really captures, like you don't, and I didn't, and, and I didn't think I had a big group. I didn't think I had a big squad because these are like deep and meaningful relationships. And they're not with people that I talk to on the phone every day right? So you can have relationships that don't, that aren't necessarily high touch, but they're very, very deep and meaningful. And I mm -hmm. think that the way that holds for friendships is the way it can hold outside of that. Even in business, as you're building relationships, like we, so one thing that happens often is that companies now, whether it's their diversity initiatives or development initiatives for younger employees will, you know, start a mentoring program, sort of a company-sponsored mentor program. So senior leaders volunteer and junior uh, folks, junior employees sign up and they get paired, they get matched. It is one of the most effective ways, one of the most effective sort of diversity initiatives that are out there, though it's still not super effective, but of the other diversity initiatives, it's one of the most impactful because, you know, the mentors and the protégés will all say they got something out of it. They tend to stay with those organizations longer. They do tend to get promoted both on both sides. But it is not always, but has the potential to be very inauthentic. And I say that because and, and I've talked to other people, it really depends on, on the connection. But what often happens is you might get a young Black woman who just, who's, you know, early in her career, maybe mid, midway in her career, who is still wearing sort of her work mask and trying to move up. And you've got an old white guy who's, you know, been successful in his career, and they're paired. In the perfect world, they will mesh well. It will be a great relationship that, you know, he will take her under his wing, give her all sorts of advice and guidance and mentorship. And, you know, maybe the relationship builds so deep that at some point he transitions and becomes her sponsor and starts to advocate on her behalf. 
that's the perfect world. I think that's the ideal scenario. But what usually happens is those conversations are awkward. The protege has to drive all of them. They have to get them on your schedule. They have to drive the agenda. They often don't know what questions to ask. They're in the conversations. They're somewhat meaningful, but because the protege is holding back, because again, they now this is it's not 100% safe space because you're talking to a senior leader within your organization. So it's evaluative, even if it's not evaluative. So you mm -hmm. still have, you know, you're still buttoned up and you're still trying to perform well and, and put on the image and all of that. And then that leader, you know, there's, they're, you know, they're always laid back because they're the leader. They, they have earned the right to, <laughs> to be laid back. Um, but they don't get to really truly know you and they don't get to connect with you. And people genuinely like and want to help and be friends with people they feel, to feel a connection with, with people who they like, with people who they have things in common with, with people who they yes. see themselves in. Mm -hmm. That or man like does not see. Yep. He doesn't see himself in her. Mm -hmm. And so she's got on a mask and he's only willing to go so far. So it's just this surface level relationship that does not have the impact that it's intended to have. Like, yeah, she might get promoted. Yeah, he might get promoted. Yeah, they might say this was cool. But that relationship is going to, that relationship is going to fizzle and burn out quickly. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10. They, and again, there are exceptions mm -hmm to this for sure, but nine times out of 10, it's gonna fizzle and burn out quickly. Yeah, I, I have been the masked person and I know exactly what you're talking about. And it, it can be even with individuals you think you have some things in common with, and then they can either be disrespectful or you can say exactly what you want and then it's not heard or, you know, variety of, of other things, you know, so then you can, I mean, there was one point where I, I was at work and I called myself a chameleon. Yeah. Do you it, think that's healthy? No, it is absolutely not healthy. But that, that chameleon is the avatar of success. That's what we have watched. Though those types of folks are who we have watched be successful. They've had to. That's perform. our perception, though. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's our perception. <laughs> we've, we've watched folks who have conformed, who have been have bent themselves up, who have been able to sort of maneuver into various uh, different groups with seemingly with ease. We have watched those folks rise the ranks and be recognized and all of those. And so we think that is the only path. We think that's the only path to success. And we are also, we are also blind enough to think that that actually is success. We don't know that person. We don't know the chameleon. Right. Are they happy? Are they miserable? Do they feel successful? Mm -hmm. They could have done all of that and still feel unfulfilled. Yes. And maybe that's why they're taking things out on others. It's not necessarily about the person they said something to. No. It's like when your parents told you about the bully on the playground. Well, it's they're, they're not upset with you. They're insecure with themselves. Yep. yep. The bully on the playground still happens at work. Still happens. Still happens at work still happens it's this defensiveness this um it's this mindset that it's a scarcity mindset that's exactly what it is it's a scarcity mindset that says um especially amongst women and minorities that says there are only a few opportunities for us may the best <laughs> one of us win and i so, hope that we can break through that we, like I feel like now there's so many people speaking out about that let's please begin to break through that we are starting I, I do feel the the winds the tides shifting on that um but it's it's still there and, and it's and it's generational I think the uh, the millennials are starting to break it down and some 
some folks mm-hmm. in um, the Generation X, you know, they're like, all right, hold up. This isn't working. Yeah. So we're not, we're not going to do to the next group what was done to us. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's valuable because there is, there is, I, I always say there's room enough for all of us to eat. We can all eat like that. We don't have mm-hmm. to uh, just scrap for, for crumbs. It's not necessary. If this table's full, there's another table for you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's tons of tables. New tables are popping up every day. And if you don't have the one that is the right fit for you, you can go build it. So there, there are tables aplenty, my friend. I love that. So build it. If it's you not don't there, have to hold go build one it. Down. <laughs> go build That's it. Fantastic. Go build it. And I, and I'll say, you know, um, one of the things that I loved about my particular business school, which was very, very small, is that we had this spirit that can best be described as collaborative competition. And so we could all be going for the same job with the same company, right? And yet we would still mock interview with each other and give feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of, oh, I'm not, right? We would still share, oh, well, did you, 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 you're interested in this company? Well, I talked to such and such there. Have you talked to them? Let me introduce you to them. Let let me walk you over or let me send an email making a warm connection, right? This collaboration that happened even when we're going after the same thing that is seemingly, seemingly in limited supply was so powerful to be a part of. Um, and it just, it just feeds this notion that again, there is room enough for us all. We all can eat and what is for you is absolutely for you. No one, no one is going to steal the job for you. No one's going to take what you deserve because what is for you, if you worry about yourself, the things that are for you are going to be for you. Mm -hmm. Everybody's strengths, circumstances, and skills are all different. Everyone has their unique set. Yes, and too many of us maybe too many is too bold of a statement, but far too often I see people, because we have this scarcity mindset, settle for something that is not necessarily for us because we're too afraid to go after the thing that is for us. Mm -hmm. We're sitting in seats that we are too big for because we're afraid of the work. We're afraid of the journey. We're afraid of potentially stumbling and falling if we go after the seat that was built for us. But we're we afraid to like go build toddler, it. Right? Like, what does a toddler do when they stumble down? They get back up. Guess what? They stumble down again. They get back up. They can do it like 40 times in an hour. We can learn so oh much. My. From a toddler, just watching them. So much, so much. I had a, um, a post probably a month or two ago where I asked folks, what do they want to be when they were four? What did they think that, what did they say they wanted to be when they grew up? Because at four, there were no constraints. No one had already gotten in your head and told you that you couldn't do it. And I will I will, I will confess, I probably watched way too much 21 Jump Street as a <laughs> child, even at four. The, the thing that I remember saying I wanted to be when I grew up mm-hmm. was a drug dealer. And I know that sounds ridiculous because I watched 21 Jump, Jump Street. And but all the drug about dealers. as a four-year-old, as a four-year-old, you know, all I saw was an adult, you know, big houses, lots of money, fancy mm-hmm. cars. They always, they always had a party going on. There was pools in the backyard, right? In every single episode, so I was like, fun. I want to do what they do. That looks fun. Mm-hmm. I want to be that. Yeah. And then some, some folks got in my head, and I think it shifted to I wanted to be a doctor, <laughs> but. <laughs> 
that is the first that's the first memory that I had was this fascination with uh with with the bad guy I, I'm uh, if I do my four tendencies uh framework I am the rebel so it um, I, I am the yep. quintessential rebel so um it's I'm very obliger <laughs> Uh, sometimes I wish, you know, I wish that I could be, and I'm not, I am just. But, you know, wishing that we could be something else, like, kind of devalues who we are, though. Right, it doesn't help. It, it, no. I can't be anybody else, so this is who I am, right? Yes. So, make it work. The, yeah, I know, I know power. a lot of, I know a lot of rebels who are actually extremely successful in life right now, so... That's great. That's a great one. So mine is, I wish I was more of, of a rebel. There are things that I can say and do to be a rebel, but I'm also working on not everything being the default of being the obliger. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm happy right. to be the obliger. I do want to serve happily. I want to be that person. Mm -hmm. But I also, you know, understand that there's boundaries and there's give and take in what I need for myself as well. So. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that the whole point of the whole point of all of these sort of assessments, and especially this one, is just to say, understand where your initial instinct comes from. Understand where you're initially drawn to, where your, re your initial reaction comes from. Because once you know that, once you understand what motivates you, then you can influence it. So I could just say, well, I'm a rebel, that's it. And so I can't tell myself what to do and you can't tell me either. <laughs> or knowing that I'm a rebel and knowing that there are things that I need to get done, I can figure out how to frame it in a way that I will actually go do it. Mm -hmm. I can recognize when I am resisting something that someone's told me and I can adjust for it, like bath time. My husband usually does bath time with our son. And every once in a while, he will say, I'm tired, can you go give him a bath? And if you ask me in the moment, when I'm you know, perfectly cuddled in my corner of the couch, and I've had a long, hard day, and I'm expecting you to do it, then I'm like, man, no, you're supposed <laughs> to do it. Why, why do you wait till the last minute to go tell me to do something you do when I'm tired too? Mm -hmm. But if you say, hey, can we split this week up? Can you take Thursday? And if you tell me that on Wednesday or Tuesday, then I have, then I can say, yep, mm -hmm. I can do that. I, I absolutely can do that. But in the moment, the, the rebel is like, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? This you do this and I do this. What's happening? <laughs> I'm tired. No. Yeah. Planning things out. That's what we've done with our family. You know, is, is you have, we have like, we have time that's allocated. It's like, there's going to be date night, calling family. We have a family outing. There's like kids dates where, you know, we do something with one of them. You know, we need like our time. So it's like, okay, I'm going to like, this is my me time for this day, you know, or this many hours or whatever else it is. And yeah, we, we have had to implement it that way. Because if you say in the moment, then yeah, the other one's like, what is happening? If you yeah. say, oh, we will do it, then it doesn't get done. But it's the same, like writing it down. Like, Write it down. <laughs> Write it down, put it on the calendar. If it's on my calendar, I'm there. Mm -hmm. If it is yeah. not on my calendar, you may not see me. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it froze on me. Oh. So I'd love to have folks join me on the 18th, 19th, or the 20th. I am hosting a free live masterclass, the Career Playbook Reboot where I am going to share the three mistakes you want to avoid in order to skyrocket your career. And I'll also talk you through my new career playbook because that old playbook is dead with four <laughs> strategies to help accelerate your career. So I hope folks can join. Um, we, we all hear about, you know, 
managing our careers using that old playbook. You know, I mentioned it before Mm -hmm. where you're putting your head down, you're working hard, you're randomly applying to jobs on LinkedIn um, and wondering why nobody is calling you back. Those rules are no longer valid. And if 2020 has taught us anything is that it's just raggedy. Throw the old playbook in a trash. (laughs) Everything has changed. Everything Mm -hmm. has changed. And yes, some things may go back to go back the same, but everything is not going back the same. There is a new normal and we want to be prepared to optimize against that new normal so that we can reach our big goals and our definition of success, not society's definition, but our own definition of success. So I hope folks will join me for the career playbook reboot, the three mistakes you want to avoid in order to skyrocket your career. Awesome. A fresh start for 2021. I love that. Absolutely. So people want to stay connected to you, I'm sure, too. Where can they find you? How can they connect? Yes, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram or Clubhouse at Coach Denny B, C-O-A-C-H-D-E-N-I-B, or on LinkedIn at Denitra Sparrow, D-E-N-I-T-R-E-S-S-E-F. E-R-R-E-L-O. Awesome. Well, this was fabulous talking to you today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you as well. I hope the rest of your day is fantastic. Thank you. You too. Enjoy your day and your week. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.